Welcome to AP Psychology Unit 2. This unit covers mental processes and a lot about memory, and it's worth quite a bit on your AP exam. This video will be a clip together video of all my Unit 2 topic review videos without the AP style questions at the end of each video. If you want to attempt AP style questions associated with each topic of Unit 2, my full Unit 2 playlist will be in the description. A quick reminder to follow the socials, especially the Instagram. Alright, I'm sorry, let's just get into Unit 2. Perception involves two things. Bottom-up processing, which is where you experience sensory inputs without any prior knowledge, and top-down processing, which is where your perception of things are influenced by prior experiences, expectations, and knowledge. Internal factors of perception include schemas, which are mental frameworks that organize and interpret info, and perceptual sets, which are predispositions that affect your interpretation. External factors include context, experience, and culture. Now let's have some fun. This is where I trick your mind with my own visual things. So let's start with some gestalt psychology principles. In this image, there are only hexagons on the screen, but your brain fills in the gaps and sees a soccer ball, which is a principle called closure. In this image, if you focus on the white color, you will see a vase, but if you focus on the black color, you might see two faces. This is called figure and ground, because you're assigning one over the other as a figure and background. In this image, you see two separate groups of dots. You likely see this one as one big group of dots because they are all close together. That is known as proximity. In this image, you likely see it as four rows of circles, triangles, circles, and circles. But I bet you didn't see it as four columns of simple shapes. This is because your brain groups together things that look alike, and this is known as similarity. Alright, now let's speed run through all the binocular and monocular cues. Retinal disparity is the difference between the images seen by the left and right eyes. Convergence is where your eyes will turn inward or converge on one object. Relative clarity is where you perceive things as being farther away if they are hazy or blurry. Relative size is where you perceive smaller objects as being farther away. Texture gradient is when something appears more detailed when it is closer. Linear perspective is when parallel lines look like they converge, but in reality they are simply just farther away. And finally, interposition is where an object blocking another object appears closer. Alright, a few more things. Change blindness refers to your failure to notice changes in an environment. Have you ever noticed how even in a crowded party full of people, you can always notice when someone says your name? This is called the cocktail party effect, which is the ability to focus on one stimulus in a noisy environment. Notice how in this image, despite the door being open, you still know it is a door and the same as the first image. This is called perceptual constancy. You know this game at arcades? It makes you think a light is moving in a circle, when in actuality lights are just turning on and off. This is known as apparent movement. Finally, I want to test something on you. Watch this video and tell me how many passes the white team makes. Go! Yeah, yeah, 13 whatever, but did you see the bear in the middle of the video? This is called inintentional blindness, where you miss something because you're focused on something else. Maybe right. we will try and understand the basic way our brain thinks. Thinking starts with concepts, which are mental groupings of similar things. A prototype is the best example of a concept, such as picturing a robin when you think of a bird. We also use schemas, which we already talked about last video, for understanding. New information is fit into schemas through assimilation, which takes in new information but ultimately keeps the schema the same, or accommodation, which changes the schema to fit new information. When it comes to solving problems, there are two main approaches. Algorithms, which address problems by attempting all possible solutions until the correct one is found, and heuristics, which are mental shortcuts that are faster but more prone to errors. Examples include representativeness heuristic, which is judging based on stereotypes, and the availability heuristic, which is judging based on how easily something comes to mind. Decision making is also shaped by other factors. A mental set makes us repeat past solutions that worked before. Priming influences decisions through subtle cues, while framing changes changes decisions based on wording. An example of framing might be when you say a 90% success rate versus a 10% failure rate. Another big thing that muddies up this entire process are cognitive biases. The gambler's fallacy is fake and definitely does not exist but on the off chance that it is real, it is the belief that past outcomes affect future ones in completely random events. The sunk cost fallacy is sticking with something just because you've already invested in it. Obviously, these are both flawed ways of thinking, which is why they are called fallacies. On another note, strong executive functions help us plan, organize, and carry out goal-directed behaviors. Creativity is divergent thinking, generating many novel ideas instead of sticking to one convergent solution. Honestly, right now is where we start our five-video deep dive into the science behind memory. This is video 
video number one. So let me explain the basic idea here. Say something happens in front of you. Your sensory memory is the initial sensory information stored in your memory for a few milliseconds to a few seconds. This sensory memory will include the echoic memory for audio senses and the iconic memory for visual senses. Now if you were to pay attention to any of these senses, that is when the information goes into the short-term memory. The senses that don't get any attention are forgotten. This information will last in the short-term memory for 15 to 30 seconds. However, for information to be passed into the long-term memory, you have to rehearse it. And I'm not talking about basic maintenance rehearsal that is just repeating the info out loud or in your head. I'm talking about elaborative rehearsal, where you link the info with meaning, existing knowledge, or associations. If you successfully do that, the info will get transferred into your long-term memory, where it will stay a few days up to your entire life. Of course, if you didn't rehearse, you would just forget the info. This is known as the multi-store memory model. It's a very old model that does oversimplify quite a bit. Let's look at a few newer models that add some useful details to this one. The working memory model essentially keeps the multi-store model, but expands on the short-term memory part of it. Basically, all it does is explain a central executive as the control center of short-term memory that will direct audio info to go to the phonological loop and spatial info to the visuospatial sketch pad, where in both places the info will be held and rehearsed in an attempt to go to long-term memory. The levels of processing model introduced a hierarchy on how info is processed deeper, saying that semantic does better than phonemic and structural. So which one of these models are correct? The answer is actually all of them for the most part. Memory is obviously a lot more complex than simple diagrams, which is why there is five different videos in AP Psychology directed to it. But these models are a great way to understand the basic part of them. Oh, and before I forget, long-term potentiation is the biological reason for why information goes from short-term to long-term memory. It is caused by two neurons firing together to make it more efficient. Long-term potentiation is the entire reason the long-term memory can exist. But really quickly, let's zoom into the long-term memory. Let's talk about the different types of memories stored here. Explicit memory is known as declarative. It houses the semantic memory, which houses facts and general knowledge, and the episodic memory, which houses personal experiences and events. Implicit memory is known as non-declarative. It has in it the procedural memory, which houses skills and habits, and it also has other implicit stuff like priming. Finally, even though it isn't one of the two major types of long-term memory, perspective memory houses all the memories of what you plan to do in the future. And that's it. You are going to be happy you clicked on this video. Literally, no joke. This video will explain the proper way to remember things. This video explains methods on encoding information into your long-term memory. If you're an actor trying to remember lines, if you are a student trying to remember information for a test, or if you're just a simple man trying to remember what day his monthly anniversary is to his girlfriend that won't get off his ass about it every time, then you've come to the right place. For this video, I will be using one of my favorite albums, American Idiot by Green Day, as an example if I were trying to memorize all of the songs in the album. First, let's talk about mnemonic devices. I'm sure you know what these are. There are plenty of examples. A good example you probably don't know is the method of low-key. This is where you envision a place in your head that you know well, and associate items you want to remember with specific locations along the way. For example, if I wanted to remember the song Give Me Novocaine in American Idiot, I can envision my long drive to a summer camp I used to work at, and a hospital I always used to go by. I can associate Novocaine with that hospital, therefore helping me to remember the song name. Now let's picture each song name in a list. Because I know a lot of things in life you need to remember are in lists. The serial position effect tells us that I am more likely to remember the first things, primacy effect, and the last few things, recency effect, on the list. This means the middle things are often forgotten. That being said, a good method to utilize here might be chunking. This is where I might split the album into separate groups and try to remember each individual group of songs, rather than the big long list we had before. We can take this even further by using categories and hierarchies. Like for example, I can separate each song by the intensity, or I can separate each song by what is said in the lyrics, or maybe which songs I like more. But finally, let me lay down the biggest truth there is. Learning too much at once overloads your memory and makes you remember less. That's right, the spacing effect is the one that tells us that spreading out learning across time is much more valuable to encoding memories than trying to learn something all in one sitting. Okay, Honestly, so I may have accidentally covered a lot of this stuff in my 2.3 video, so I will try to keep this short. I'm gonna assume you get the general idea of how this model on the screen works. So let's review a few things. And by a few things, I mean two big facts, capacity and duration. We already know the sensory memory lasts a few milliseconds to a few seconds. However, it has a very large capacity to hold information. The reason behind this is because it holds so much sensory information in it. The fact is, a lot of this sensory information is forgotten, unless you pay attention to it. Now let's move to the short term slash working memory. We know info here lasts 15 to 30 seconds, but that number isn't ironclad. When you rehearse something here, particularly when you do maintenance rehearsal, you lengthen the amount of time information stays until eventually 
Eventually, you can successfully do elaborate rehearsal and bridge the gap and transfer the info into long-term memory. The other thing you could do is forget the information, but let's not talk about that. It's pretty universal that the short-term memory can hold about seven plus or minus two items in it, but that has been recently debated. Finally, the long-term memory. This one is actually quite easy. Information lasts here from a couple of days up to an entire lifetime. And believe it or not, the long-term memory is said to be virtually unlimited in its capacity. Moving on, the autobiographical memory is simply the memory of your own life containing the episodic and semantic memory. Autobiographical memory is essentially the reason behind why memories of your own life are your most memorable. It's also very interesting because some people have proven superior autobiographical memories, suggesting that there potentially is a biological factor behind memories. Now let's go over limitations that affect memories. I bet you're sitting there all smiling like, I know what amnesia is, I don't need to learn it. Wrong! There are two types of amnesia. Entrograde amnesia is when you can't learn new information. Retrograde amnesia is when you can't remember previously learned information. Alzheimer's is a very sad disease where your memory, thinking skills, and ability to perform daily activities slowly diminishes. And finally, let me ask you a question. Do you remember the day you were born? For any of you that said yes, you're wrong. If you really do think you're right, that is a flawed false memory caused by reconstruction. The truth is, when you're a baby, your brain is informed enough to remember things long term. This is known as infantile amnesia. Only when you get to be about ages 3, 4, and 5 will you truly start remembering things. Alright, so I know you've seen this model of memory from me like a billion times by now, but did you know I actually forgot something on it? Really quickly, let me explain what I mean. When something is in your long-term memory, you can't just access it. I like to imagine long-term memory as a library of books. If you actually want to remember any of this content, you need to walk through it and actually find the correct book. This is a process known as memory retrieval. You are trying to get your memory back from your long-term memory into your working memory so you can recall it, but some memories are easier to recall than others. I'm sure you've had moments in your life where it took a while to remember something. Memory retrieval occurs by one of two things. Recall, which is where you retrieve and bring previously stored information back into conscious awareness without any cues, or recognition, where you identify and confirm whether a stimulus has been encountered before by using retrieval cues. You will have more successful retrieval if you use specific retrieval practice processes, like the testing effect where you take practice quizzes or tests on previously studied material, or metacognition, where you think about your thought processes. Both of these are proven ways to better retrieve memory. Retrieval can also be improved by context-dependent memory, which is remembering better in the same environment, state-dependent memory, which is remembering better in the same physical state, and mood-congruent memory, which is recalling memories that match your current mood. Are you Honest? ready to learn one, two, three, four, five, nine terms in this video? I know I am! Essentially, this last video on memory will try to explain possible reasons why memory failure or errors may occur. Let's start with the forgetting curve. Imagine you've just studied a bunch on day zero. This means you start out with 100% retention. If you don't study again, this curve shows how much you'll remember. You lose a lot in the first few days, but then forgetting slows down and levels off, leaving only the most durable information. Now let's talk about things that negatively affect retrieval. Encoding failure is when information never fully goes from the short-term to long-term memory and simply gets forgotten. Proactive interference is where previously learned materials hinders learning something new, whereas retroactive interference is where newly learned materials hinders the memory of previously learned materials. There's also inadequate retrieval, with a good example being the tip of the tongue phenomenon, where you feel like you're on the verge of retrieving something despite not being able to. There are also things that can affect the true accuracy of memories. The misinformation effect is when you are told something completely wrong about an event and therefore misremember it. Source amnesia is where you can recall an event or information, but not where or whom you learned it from. Memory consolidation turns otherwise fragile memories in the short-term memory into not-so-accurate stable long-term memories. And imagination inflation is where you become a thousand percent more confident in a memory after vividly imagining the event. Finally, I want to examine a specific area of the psychodynamics approach to memory. Memories sometimes can be repressed or simply forgotten because of your own mind or ego. This is of course to save your ego from distress. But remember, fragile masculinity doesn't exist. Or at least, that's what all the girls around me keep saying. Honestly. Intelligence! What a word! You might wonder, what does this word even mean? Oh boy, do I have a long video for you, my friend. Throughout history, people have tried to measure and define intelligence. But because of things like biases, nothing concrete was ever made. One of the original measures of intelligence was one mental measure by Charles Spearman called G. Literally, just the letter G. But once intelligence was realized to be more than just a single factor, thank you Howard Gardner, the whole G thing was mostly shoved aside. One of the early IQ, or intelligent quotient, formulas derived was this one on the screen. 
Needless to say, this formula is not used no more. Now in the present, for a test to matter, it has to follow something called good psychometrics. That means it has to be standardized, meaning everyone takes it in the same way, and it also must be valid and reliable. Speaking of which, why don't we really quickly talk about validity versus reliability. Reliability means a test consistently produces the same results when repeated, while validity means the test accurately measures what it's supposed to measure. Validity actually splits into two types. Construct validity, which checks if the test really measures the concept it claims to, and predictive validity, which checks if the test can actually forecast future performance. Also, a test must be culturally fair. That's because stereotype threat can make people do worse if they're reminded of a negative stereotype about their group, while stereotype lift can make people do better if they're reminded of a positive one. Now let's move on to the modern measure of IQ, which is measured by the standardized test we talked about before. The average IQ over the entire globe has actually increased quite a bit over time. This is known as the Flynn effect, and it is caused by increasing societal factors like a higher socioeconomic status, access to better healthcare, and better nutrition. Poverty, discrimination, and educational inequalities can negatively influence intelligence scores of individuals and societal groups around the world. It's also important to note that IQ scores vary more within groups than between groups. Now say that you want to join the military, or that cool new job you always wanted, or that college you always wanted to get into. In America, IQ tests have been used to limit access to all of those things. And yes, that also includes immigration. Alright, a few more things to go over. Achievement tests are a measure of what someone knows, while aptitude tests predict how well someone will do in the future. Now the mindsets. A fixed mindset is the belief that your intelligence is fixed from your birth and impossible to grow, while a growth mindset is the belief that you can learn new things through effort and participation. I'm sure you can guess which mindset makes a better human being on the screen. And would you look at that, you made it to the end of the entire video. Whoa whoa whoa, don't click off the video yet. Why not instead click on this end screen? This was a vlog I did about a year ago to Salt Lake City, and in my unbiased opinion, it's possibly the greatest video ever made on this platform. Why not click on it? Well, why are you still here? You should have already clicked on the video.